Gordon was cross. Why should Henry have a new shape? He grumbled. A shape good enough for me is good enough for him. He goes gallivanting off, leaving us to do his work, and comes back saying how happy he feels. It's disgraceful. And there's another thing. Henry whistles too much. No respectable engine ever whistles loudly at stations. It isn't wrong, but we just don't do it. Poor Henry didn't feel happy anymore. Never mind, whispered Percy. I'm glad you're home again. I like your whistling. Goodbye, Henry, called Gordon. We're glad to have you with us again, but remember what I said. Later, Henry stopped at Edward's station. Hello, Henry, said Edward. You look splendid. I was pleased to hear your happy whistle yesterday. Thank you, Edward, smiled Henry. Shh, can you hear something? It sounds like Gordon, said Edward, and it ought to be Gordon. But Gordon never whistled like that. It was Gordon. He came rushing down the hill at a tremendous rate. He didn't look at Henry, and he didn't look at Edward. He screamed straight through the station and disappeared. Well, said Edward. It isn't wrong, chuckled Henry, but we just don't do it. And he told Edward what Gordon had said. Meanwhile, Gordon screeched along the line. The noise was awful. At the station, everyone covered their ears. Sir Topham Hatt covered his ears, too. Take him away, he bellowed, and stop that noise. Gordon puffed sadly away, but he wouldn't stop whistling until two fitters climbed up and knocked his whistle valve in place. That night, Gordon slunk into the shed. He was glad it was empty. It isn't wrong, murmured Henry to no one in particular, but we just don't do it. No one mentioned whistles. Next morning, Henry was enjoying himself enormously. I feel so well, I feel so well, he sang. Trickety-truck, trickety-truck, hummed his coaches. Then he saw some boys on a bridge. Beep, beep, hello, he whistled. Oh, he called. The boys didn't wave and take his number. They thought it fun to drop stones on him instead. They've broken our glass! They've broken our glass! cried the coaches. The passengers weren't hurt, but they were cross. Call the police! No, said the driver. Leave it to Henry and me. What will you do? they asked. Can you keep a secret? Yes, yes. Well then, said the driver, Henry is going to sneeze at those boys. Lots of people were waiting at the station just before the bridge. They wanted to see what would happen. Henry has plenty of ashes, said the driver. Please keep all windows shut till we've passed the bridge. Henry's as excited as we are, aren't you, old fellow? Henry felt more stuffed up than excited. Soon they could see the boys, and they all had stones. Are you ready, Henry? said the driver. Sneeze hard when I tell you. Now, he said. Achoo! Well done, Henry, laughed his driver. Henry went home, hoping that next time he saw Gordon and the boys, they would have learned not to be so mean. Trevor, the traction engine, enjoyed living in the vicarage orchard. Edward came to see him every day, but sometimes Trevor didn't have enough work to do. I do like to keep busy all the time, he sighed one day, and I do like company, especially children's company. 
Cheer up, smiled Edward. Sir Topham Hatt has work for you at his new harbor. I'm to take you to meet Thomas today. Oh, exclaimed Trevor happily. A harbor, the seaside, children, that will be lovely. Thomas was on his way to the harbor with a trainload of metal pilings. They were needed to make the harbor wall firm and safe. Hello, Thomas, said Edward. This is Trevor, a friend of mine. He's a traction engine. Thomas eyed the newcomer doubtfully. A what engine? A traction engine, explained Trevor. I run on roads instead of rails. Can you take me to the harbor, please? Sir Topham Hatt has a job for me. Yes, of course, replied Thomas, but he was still puzzled. Workmen coupled Trevor's car to Thomas's train and soon they were ready to start their journey. I'm glad Sir Topham Hatt needs me, called Trevor. I don't have enough to do sometimes, you know, although I can work anywhere. In orchards, on farms, in scrapyards, even at harbors. But you don't run on rails, puffed Thomas. I'm a traction engine. I don't need rails to be useful, replied Trevor. You wait and see. When they reached the harbor, they found everything in confusion. Cars had been derailed, blocking the line, and stone slabs lay everywhere. We must get these pilings passed, said Thomas's driver. They are essential. Trevor, we need you to drag them round this mess. Just the sort of job I like, replied Trevor. Now you'll see, Thomas. I'll soon show you what traction engines can do. Trevor was as good as his word. He dragged the pilings clear with chains and towed them into position. Who needs rails, he muttered cheerfully to himself. Later, Thomas brought Annie and Clarabelle to visit him. Thomas was most impressed. Now I understand how useful a traction engine can be. The coaches were full of children. Trevor gave them rides along the harbor. He liked this best of all. He's very kind, said Annie. He reminds me of Thomas, added Clarabelle. Everyone was sorry when it was time for Trevor to go. Thomas pulled him to the junction. A small tear came into Trevor's eye. Thomas pretended not to see. He whistled gaily to make Trevor happy. I'll come and see you if I can, he promised. The vicar will look after you, and there's plenty of work for you now at the orchard, but we may need you again at the harbor someday. That would be wonderful, said Trevor. That evening, Trevor stood remembering his new friend Thomas, the harbor, and most of all, the children. Then he went happily to sleep in the shed at the bottom of the orchard. Daisy, the diesel rail car's work in the countryside, was full of surprises. But she was frightened of bulls and cows, and she remained very lazy and stubborn. One day, Toby brought Henrietta to the station where Percy was grumpily shunting. Hello, Percy. I see Daisy's left the milk behind again. I'll have to make a special journey with it, I suppose. Anyone would think I'd nothing to do, grumbled Percy. Tell you what, replied Toby, I'll take the milk, you fetch my freight cars. The drivers and station master agreed.
Percy had never been to the quarry before. He began ordering the freight cars about. Hurry along, he said. The freight cars grumbled to each other. This is Toby's place. Percy's got no right to poke his funnel up here and push us around. They whispered and passed the word. Pay Percy back. Pay Percy back. Come along, puffed Percy. No nonsense. We'll give him nonsense, giggled the freight cars. But they followed so quietly that Percy thought they were under control. Suddenly, they saw a notice ahead. All trains stopped to pin down brakes. Beep, beep! Brakes, conductor, please! But before he could check them, the freight car surged ahead. On, on, they cried. Help, help, whistled Percy. The man on duty at the crossing rushed to warn traffic with his red flag, but was too late to switch Percy to the runaway siding. Frantically trying to grip the rails, Percy slid into the yard. Beep, beep, look out! The brake van was in smithereens. Percy's driver and fireman had jumped clear, but Percy was stranded. Next day, Sir Topham had arrived. Toby and Daisy had helped to clear the wreckage, but Percy remained on his perch of freight cars. We must now try, said Sir Topham Hatt, to run the branch line with Toby and a diesel. You have put us in an awkward predicament, Percy. I am sorry, sir. You must stay there till we are ready, continued Sir Topham Hatt. And you really must be more careful with freight cars. Percy sighed. The freight cars groaned beneath his wheels. He quite understood about awkward predicaments. Sir Topham Hatt spoke severely to Daisy, too. My engines work hard. I send lazy engines away. Daisy was ashamed. However, Toby says you worked hard after Percy's accident. So you shall have another chance. Thank you, sir, said Daisy. I will work hard. Toby says he'll help me. Excellent. What Toby doesn't know about branch line problems isn't worth knowing. Our Toby's an experienced engine. Next day, Thomas came back. And Percy was sent to be mended. Annie and Clarabel were delighted to see Thomas again, and he took them for a run at once. All are now friends, and Toby has taught Daisy a great deal. She shooed a cow off the line the other day all by herself. That shows you, doesn't it? Gordon the big engine and Thomas the tank engine puffed buffer to buffer back home. It had been a busy day. First Thomas had teased Gordon about the time that the big engine had slid into a ditch. Then Thomas fell down a mine and Gordon came to his rescue. Remember Thomas, called Gordon grandly. United we stand, together we fall. You help me and I'll help you. I'll remember, replied Thomas, but I hope Sir Topham Hatt forgives us soon. Suddenly they noticed something. As the two engines whistled into the sheds, everywhere they looked they saw paint pots and painters. Bust my buffers, said Thomas. What's happening? Shh, whispered Percy. Sir Topham Hatt's going to tell us now. Ladies and gentlemen and engines. I am honored to inform you that Her Majesty the Queen herself is coming here to visit us. Now, on with the preparations. The engines wondered who would pull the royal train. I'm too old to pull important trains, said Edward. I'm in disgrace, sighed Gordon. He'll choose me, of course, boasted James. 
You, snorted Henry, you can't climb hills. He will ask me to pull the train, and I'll have a new coat of paint. Then the rain came. Henry's driver and fireman covered up their cab to keep dry. A painter was on the ladder above the line. Henry's smoke blew high into the air. The painter couldn't see. Both he and the paint pot fell all over mm. Henry. Poor Henry. Well, you're not a pretty picture, sneered the painter. Sir Topham Hatt spoke next. You look like an iced cake, Henry. That won't do for the royal train. I must make other arrangements. Gordon and Thomas were waiting for him. Please, Please sir. sir. One at a time, replied Sir Topham Hatt. Yes, Gordon? May Thomas have his branch line again? Hmm. I think you are both sorry and deserve a treat. Edward will go in front to clear the line. Thomas will look after the coaches, and Gordon will pull the train. The great day came. All the engines worked hard, bringing people to the town. Thomas sorted out their coaches in the yard. Edward steamed in. Beep! The Queen is here! Then Gordon whistled as he approached the station. Everyone knew that sound. The Queen's train glided into the station. Gordon was spotless and his brass shone brightly. Sir Topham Hatt stood to attention. Welcome, ma'am. The Queen thanked him for a splendid run and asked to see all the engines. Beep, beep, whistled Toby and Percy. Shh, hissed Henry and James. But Toby and Percy didn't care. Three cheers for the Queen. Beep, beep, whistled the engines. When it was time to leave, the Queen spoke specially to Thomas, who fetched her coaches. Then to Edward, and finally to Gordon, who took her away. No engines ever felt prouder than those on Sir Topham Hatt's railway. It was a cold winter's morning on the island of Sodor. The wind was bitter and the ground hard with frost. Thomas and Percy were cold and cross. All I want is a warm boiler, huffed Thomas. Firelighter knows that. He's late. He's not late, replied Percy. This weather woke us up early. Gusts of wind swirled round the shed, tossing flakes of snow toward Thomas. Then they swooshed round Percy, too. Why don't we talk about something else, shivered Percy. Yes, replied Thomas, like how silly we'll look when our funnels turn into icicles. That's not funny. Maybe we'll stop feeling cold if we talk about warm things, like sunshine and steam. And firelighters, muttered Thomas. Scarves, continued Percy. Scarves, laughed Thomas. That's what you need, Percy, a woolly scarf round your funnel. Thomas was only teasing, but Percy thought happily about scarves until the firelighter came. Sir Topham Hatt was enjoying hot porridge for breakfast. He was looking forward to taking important visitors on a tour of the railway and had pressed his special trousers. I shall put them in my trunk, Sir Topham Hatt said to his wife, and change into them just before the photographs are taken. Then he set off to catch his train. Percy was now working hard. His fire was burning nicely, and he had plenty of steam, but he still thought about scarves. He saw them everywhere he went.
My funnel's cold. My funnel's cold, he puffed. I want a scarf. I want a scarf. Rubbish, Percy, said Henry. Engines don't wear scarves. Engines with proper funnels do, replied Percy. You've only got a small one. Before Henry could answer, Percy puffed away. Henry snorted. He was looking forward to pulling the special train. It was time for the photographs. Everyone was excited. Sir Topham Hatt was waiting on the platform for his trousers. They were in a trunk amongst a big load of baggage. The porters were taking the baggage trolley across the line. They were walking backwards to see that nothing fell off. Percy was still being cheeky. His driver always shut off steam just outside the station. Percy wanted to surprise the coaches by coming in as quietly as he could. But the porters didn't hear him either. Percy gave them such a fright that boxes and bags burst everywhere. Oh, groaned Percy. Sticky streams of jam trickled down Percy's face. A top hat hung on his lamp iron. Worst of all, a pair of trousers coiled lovingly around his funnel. Everyone was very angry. Sir Topham Hatt seized the top hat. Mine, he said. Percy, look at this. Yes, sir, I am, sir. My best trousers, too. Yes, sir, please, sir. We must pay the passengers for their spoiled clothes, and my trousers are ruined. I hope this will teach you not to play tricks with the coaches. Percy went off to the yard. He felt very silly. On the way, he met James. Hello, Percy. So you found a scarf, eh? But legs go in trousers, not funnels. And he puffed away to tell Henry the news. That evening, Thomas and Percy were resting in the shed. Percy's driver had taken away the trousers and given Percy a good rubdown. Firelighters promised to come early tomorrow, said Thomas. Henry arrived. He'd enjoyed taking the visitors around and now felt sorry for Percy, too. Driver says the weather will be warmer tomorrow. You won't need a scarf, Percy. Certainly not, replied Percy. Engines don't need scarves. Engines need warm boilers. Everyone knows that. Sir Topham Hatt's engines are proud of how useful they are. It makes them feel important, but none of them feels more important than Gordon. Watch out, Gordon wished. You'll get my paint all sooty. Pulling freight cars is a sooty job, teased Salty. But then you wouldn't know. Of course not, Gordon huffed importantly. Express engines don't pull freight cars. It wouldn't be dignified. Dingy fried, puzzled Percy. What's that? Dignified, Gordon corrected. It means, it means that someone's too big for his buffers, teased Salty. Pa, said Gordon, and he puffed away. That evening, fog covered the island of Sodor. Everything slowed down, and soon the docks were packed with waiting freight cars. This caused confusion and delay. Sir Topham Hatt came to the sheds. He was in a great hurry. Henry, Thomas, and Percy, he said, you must go to the docks immediately. Yes, sir, they whistled. Then Sir Topham Hatt turned to the big blue engine. You too, Gordon, he said. I need a big engine to take the freight cars where they won't be in the way. Freight cars, huffed Gordon. He could not believe what he had heard. Gordon wasn't happy to be pulling freight cars. He waited impatiently while they were shunted into place. Hurry up, hurry up, chuffed Gordon crossly. Why the rush, Gordon, asked Thomas. If I must pull freight cars, then I'll show Salty how an express engine pulls freight cars, Gordon huffed. Careful, Captain, Salty tooted. You don't want to get too big for your buffers. But Gordon ignored Salty. The next morning, Gordon raced along with his heavy load. Now this is how you pull freight cars, he puffed. 
the signalman had accidentally left the points switched to the branch line. Gordon rattled through the junction. That's strange. I'm on the branch line. Oh no, the signalman cried. Express trains aren't supposed to go that way. But it was too late. Gordon had already raced into the distance. The old branch line was weak and rusty. There were signs warning all the trains to go slow. But Gordon ignored the signs. I'm an express engine. I don't go slow, he said. And he went even faster. The branch line couldn't take his weight, and the rails buckled. Oh, help! Gordon cried as he slid off the tracks and into a field. was hurt, but poor Gordon felt very undignified. What will Sir Topham Hatt say, he groaned. He found out soon enough. Well, Gordon, said Sir Topham Hatt, you wanted to show Salty a thing or two, and you've certainly done that. You've shown him how silly it is to ignore go-slow signs. Sorry, sir, said Gordon, and he let out a sad whoosh of steam. Gordon was soon repaired and back at the docks ready for work, but he was very unhappy with himself. Everyone makes mistakes, said Thomas, even you. Salty's sorry he teased you, puffed James. And I'm sorry I was too big for my buffers, chuffed Gordon. And all the engines gave a jolly toot, even Gordon. Hurry up! I'm a busy engine, puffed Henry. Goods arrive night and day at the docks. Sometimes Henry and the other engines work so hard that their axles ache. Sir Topham Hatt brought in a new engine to help with the heavy workload. He was long and had ten drive wheels. He looked very strong. This is Murdoch. He's going to be pulling freight on the main line. Ahoy, matey! shouted Salty. Welcome, Murdoch, called Harvey. You're the biggest engine I've ever seen, cried Thomas. <laughs> You're a chatty lot, Murdoch said quietly. Soon Murdoch was coupled to a long, long line of heavy freight cars. His boiler strained, his wheel started to turn, and the mighty engine chuffed away. Murdoch longed for some peace and quiet. But everywhere he went, it was noisy and crowded. At the end of the day, Murdoch was looking forward to a good night's rest. But Salty and Harvey were full of questions. What's the longest train you've ever pulled? Have you ever worked Marseille? Have you ever crashed? Please, I want some peace and quiet. And I don't want to share a shed with chatterboxes. No need to be rude, huffed Harvey. Hey, we're only being friendly, matey. The next morning, Murdoch collected another long, heavy train. This time, he chuffed into the beautiful countryside. It was splendid. At last, he had some peace and quiet. Suddenly, his driver applied the brakes. There were sheep on the tracks. The sheep escaped from that field, said the driver, through that broken fence. The driver and the fireman tried to chase the sheep back. First this way, 
And then that way. They tried everything, but nothing worked. We'll never move these sheep by ourselves, complained the fireman. I'll go and phone for help, sighed the driver. Murdoch was very unhappy. The noisy sheep were spoiling his peace and quiet. Sir Topham Hatt was enjoying afternoon tea when he got the call. Sheep, he exclaimed loudly. I'll send Toby with the farmer immediately. The sheep were becoming noisier and noisier. Please stop, groaned Murdoch. I'd rather be back with the chatterbox engines. Just then, Toby chuffed into view. Toby, exclaimed Murdoch. We're certainly glad to see you. Before long, the farmer and his dog went to work. And the sheep were soon safely in their field. And Murdoch was on his way again. Thanks, Toby. That evening, Murdoch parked between Harvey and Salty. But Murdoch spoke first. I'm sorry that I was cross, he chuffed. I'm very pleased to share a shed with you. And we're very pleased to have your company, said Harvey. Aye, we are, added Salty. It reminds me of a story. Murdoch smiled. The sound of ba ba would have kept him awake, but a salty story would send him happily to sleep.